Sue writes, we were excited to see potato cakes on the marquees, on our, on the marquee, I should say, on our Arby's in Brooklyn Center over the holiday weekend. weekend. Needless to say, we stopped in, got our fix while supplies lasted, and they were going fast. Yes, I think July 1 technically was the date at most Arby's where the, um, the long national nightmare ended, the potato cake, uh, much discussed on this show ever since it was went away. Uh, was back. I will add this caveat, though. There ain't nothing worse than a soft potato cake. And that's, this is where it gets tricky. If you go in, and I, you asked, you know, you mentioned this before, maybe you can order extra well-done potato cake. Yeah. I'm not sure it works that way, but maybe the only way to find out is to try and to ask, because I've never asked. Um... A soggy potato cake, back up, no potato cake is better than a soggy potato cake, in my view, right? If it's really? a soggy, oh yeah, there, wow. is it, you don't agree? You would rather, I'd rather have, no cake be at deprived all. deprived of the cake. Than a soggy cake. Than a soggy cake. Man, I think I'm taking the soggy you cake. Take the so- you'll take yeah. any cake at all. Any cake is, all right. is it better to me. have soggy caked or to have not caked at all? I would say See, I'm the same on caked. hash browns. If the hash yeah. browns are not well done... Take them away. I I don't need them. I I don't I don't eat Not them. They work. taste grease greasier. They just don't you know feel like they're cooked. I don't know. Um, yeah, I gotta have a potato cake. That's uh, I'll even you know what I'll take a burnt one. If if they would could burn them, if they could semi char the cake, yeah, I'd eat it. I bet you could ask for that. You think so? You can ask for different accommodations on the sandwiches and fast food places. Can you? Yes. Okay. Yes. You could say, would you mind throwing it in the fryer for a couple of more minutes? I'm happy to wait. Happy to wait. Yeah, don't complain about it. All they the do is time. dunk it in the grease thing and let you know, it go down. Now, nah, see, yeah, you're Just right. Just leave it's one in for a couple more seconds. Further reminder, it's not the healthiest food choice. That's okay. But every once in a while, yes. you got to mix it up. Um, Richard from Stillwater. There's no place for all the swearing, especially the F-Heimers. It's not cute. Not edgy. Just plain filthy. My mom is still right. I'm absolutely, uh, hold on a second here, Let's scroll down a little bit. Oh, God, I lost it. It's been a while since I've been on this computer, obviously, so I have to sort of relearn it, I guess. Let's scroll down. Um, I'm absolutely foul mouth in daily life, writes uh, Dave in Chicago, and I can't stand the casual swearing in Edwards' peak conference. It's got to learn to rein it in. It's already played out. Well, I I, I fear that this is, as I said, this is one of those issues that's going to be all generated by um, age. And I will tell you that it's still not a concession I'm interested in making as someone who has a fairly foul mouth in private uh, more than um, I'd like to acknowledge, but I can't deny it, so I won't try to. I do think, I still do believe in a little bit of separation of church and state. I do. I don't think anybody should have to apologize for that. And part of it is for me, like I said, and, and you know, Johnny mentioned it, and I said the same thing when we and we talked about this without you last week. Um, when when who's the new uh, Lakers coach? JJ Reddick. When, when JJ did it, it was to say, you know, basically bleep you to the question. Yep. And I don't care. He was saying the opposite. He was saying the degree to which he cared, he had to use an expletive. But the expletive has been has reached a point where it's so often used in those situations that I don't even, I, I yawn. I, I don't even think it's cool at this point. And I do think, even if it's in Edward's lexicon, there's a lot of things that we all, I think, over the course of our lives, figure out that we, you know, maybe was part of the way we did things. And we say, well, we can, that that can be altered a little bit. We can learn from that a little bit, or we can go a little bit different uh, direction. I just think it's be- it's come too easy to everybody. And I, again, it doesn't keep me up nights, right? but I do think it's been sort of grandfathered in too easily for me. And I, I just don't think it's necessary at all. Well, from a personally selfish standpoint, it makes my job really hard when you want to play a sound bite. <laughs> That's true. Because you'll send me some audio and go, That's can we true. play this? Can we clean it up a yeah. little? And sometimes we can. It's one of the reasons why we don't hear from Kevin Garnett as often as we'd like to. Because he has great stuff with Paul Pierce on his podcast and show that he does with Paul. We can use 
usually the only time we can use it is if somebody else has already done the bleeping for us because he uses it so much. That's true. And it will take so long. We had so one. Pretty much any KG quote, yes, right? We yeah, had yeah. one a couple months, like a month or so ago. I think we counted like nine bleeps in 90 seconds, and that was every word in the book. I think I'm with you. Like, it has gotten too fast and too loose and too easy. And I guess the only, what's the word for it? Resolution for it would be, we all just decide as a society that there are no more bad words and every word is fine. And we just say whatever word, and then there's no, we don't have to worry about it. Yeah, no one right. gets their feelings hurt. And we don't have to explain to our kids that you can't use this in this professional setting. But meanwhile, Anthony Edwards and Kevin Garnett and JJ Reddick are all using them because the language doesn't offend me, but it is, I understand why it's off putting and why it is. It, it does. I think it'll, it gets, gets a little well, pear shaped. And I think part of it is, we all encourage it to the degree, like I said, the the night Edwards did it, one of the nights he did it, one of the nights, I guess I should qualify. He does it every night. I, uh, It was a funny line because he was playing off of, you know, what he had told the ball boy about coming going back to Denver, whatever it was. Um, although I think he actually did the same thing in Dallas, too. Uh, but whatever, regardless. So we're all kind of encouraging it because it, it, it is, it's it feels funny and, and it, but I think the more we laugh, the e- easier I think it becomes for for people to. Because Garnett's a good example. I mean, Garnett, nobody's more foul mouth than Garnett. But I don't remember that he did it that often in like formal press conference settings. Do you? Now that's a long time ago. One right. could say, but the fact is, he had the same language then. But even he, I think, felt okay. Yep. This, uh, uh, if I'm doing a video, I, I I'm gonna let I'm gonna let go with what I do because that's who I am. But I'm not necessarily going to do that in a in a. I don't think did he have any Effenheimers when he uh, received the MVP trophy? I don't, I don't remember. I remember don't that be so. a big press conference for that? Yes, I don't think he probably don't remember did. him doing that. No, I'm thinking about all the the KG sound bites we play from yeah. his career, including Game Seven. I'm ready for war. I don't think he used it there. <laughs> for war, yes. I'm pretty sure he didn't use one. it there. Yeah. I'm just trying to think. Um. So the it, JJ one really bothered me though. Oh, big time. Because it's just needless. That's just gratuitous and it's just Well, you're the guy the JJ apology. I'm on board with him. I, I like him. I'm curious about how he's gonna do. I like his content, as the kids say. Great podcaster. Are you but the, I didn't need that. Are you the same with uh do you need your, your French fries to be crisp? Because I do. I'm not as picky. I can kind of go. You I don't know, know if, soft fry. I'm fine with a soft fry. Okay. I think if the flavor's good enough. Yeah, I don't mind it. Yeah. I don't mind. I prefer. I prefer, like I said, a little crispness to my fries as well. But again, it depends if the flavor's really good. Like, I'm thinking of the who's got the waffle fries. Is it um, uh, Chick Fil A? Do they have the waffle? They fries? do. Yeah. Uh, by the way, have you tried the uh, my my daughter do- Giovanni discovered the place. Um, it's been around, I think, for a while here. At least, I think there's one in Minnetonka. I don't know how many others. Uh, Dave's Hot Chicken, the Chris Humphreys production. Is that the Chris Humphreys yes, production? Yes, one of them. Yeah. Um, I I haven't. People rave about it. She loves it. Yep. I tried it for the first time and I liked it, but then I see I get no spice. You can get it without spice. Mm-hmm. And I was kind of worried about what that if will that remove all the flavor. But I thought it was actually pretty good because I don't like hot on chicken, even though that's the point of the place. I even guess. though it's called Dave's, Dave's hot, hot chicken. Hot chicken, right? Yeah. You want the mild chicken. I don't love the Chick Fil A fries. Now that you brought up Chick Fil A, no, they're, I'm I'm not crazy about it. those are the waffle ones. I yes. think, aren't they? Yeah, and they're just okay. For they're me. okay. Yeah, I like the Arby's curly fries. Yes, those are decadent and good. Uh, Arby's has basically cornered the potato market. Let's be yeah, honest. Yeah, that's fair. They got maybe they got rid of the potato fries. cake just to make it even for everybody so else. So in the in the beef and cheddar uh, in college, you know, especially first couple of years, it's like you're you're you get. To that Sunday where you're at the dorm, the food is, there's no food, at least we're at IU at that point. Mm-hmm. So you're on your own for dinner. You're down to your last like $3.42. So you're literally counting your pennies to say, okay, what can I get at Arby's? Should I get the hot ham and cheese and an order potato cake? That was always my order. Or should I get the beef and cheddar? With a cherry Coke. And I look back in the beef and cheddar experience and I say, as I recall it, the cheese was kind of like out of a, out of a, like a, a, a squeeze box, a dispenser. Yes. Um, do they still yeah, they, do they, that they with the melt, cheese? They weren't melting no. slices of provolone. Do they still do that? With the, is it still out of a dispenser for the beef and cheddar, the cheese? I would imagine yes. Okay. Yes. 
Because I look back on that and I go, that that doesn't seem like that might have been the healthiest of choices. I'm assuming that the Swiss for the ham and Swiss was also out of some kind of container. No, it you wasn't. So? It was not. No, that was the beauty of it. Interesting. Because you could actually watch them put the sandwich together oh, occasionally. I didn't realize. It was like, yeah, it was, they melted the cheese. The beef and cheddar, it felt like it was out of that dispenser. That would like make sense. Said. Yeah. Like you're buying concession stand nachos. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah, yeah which is fine. It serves the purpose. Uh, we're late. We have to put a grain in somebody's hand. We do. The fan in big deck.com. Want to give you a shot to put a grain in your hand with our national cash contest. And the keyword for the four o'clock hour is money. So go to KFAN.com and enter the keyword money. Kevin Seifert at the bottom of the hour. Interesting sauce at uh, Dave's Hot Chicken. Is it Dave's Famous Hot Chicken or just Dave's Hot Chicken? I think it's just Dave's Hot Chicken. I I don't even know it 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 looks a little cheesy, but I know that it's cheesy, a little bit sweet, but it's a good sauce, dipping sauce, as they say in the business. Mm-hmm. My first experience with it is uh, as well. We got it in the greater uh, Chicago area. I don't think they have a bunch there. I think they have a couple there as well. Is it taking the nation by storm, or is it too early for that? I mean, it's growing. Okay. I remember being in Indiana okay. for go for women's basketball, and Trent in the SID was very excited because he got to go to Dave's Hot Chicken, uh, something he discovered while he was working in South Carolina. So I think it may have started in the South okay. area and is now working its way this way. So uh, airport procedure question for you. Uh-oh. I don't I don't fly as often as I used to. I certainly don't fly as often as you do these days, at least during you know your season. But we got in late last night, uh, landed from Chicago O'Hare International Airport at about 11. About 11? Yeah, about 11.05, right in that range. We were, we were about an hour late getting out of uh, Chicago. And we deplane. We're on the, um, I think it's be the E section, American Airlines. We deplane, we make the long walk because Americans got, you know, they're penalized for having, they got like the last four or five yeah. gates in that section. We let you land here, but barely. And then you take to get the nice exercise out. And then I look for the usual spot where then you go down some, either an escalator or stairs to hit baggage claim. And that is closed. So I start following, we start following, because we had made a stop. Uh, uh, Giovanni wanted to use the restroom, so we made a stop. Some people were ahead of us. So then you, we catch up with the crowd, and you're sort of following the crowd, and they're all noticing, well, that, that way down is, is blocked off. And what do we do now? And the next exit available for le- you know, leaving that part of the terminal leaves you at the main terminal level. Not at the lower level where the bag, you want to retrieve your bags. Now, what I don't know is whether if we continue to walk further towards the Delta set, one of the Delta sections, towards really the other end of the airport, if there would have been, because I know there's another exit where you go down and you're immediately on that level. But why is it, is it too much to ask at a major, you know, highly respected airport? Because then you got you're on the main level, and it's a little bit, bit tricky where to then get down one level from there, uh, unless you want to take the elevator. Which again, you say, whatever. I mean, I thought it was automatic. You get off a plane, you take an escalator to the lowest level, and you're right there. You find the conveyor that you're looking for. We didn't have that option. Why is that? Do we not have enough people? Was it too late at night? It seems to me you should be able. To not have to go through extra steps to get to the low, the lowest level. Every airport I've ever been in, every airport I've ever been in, allows you to immediately go down to the lowest level where you are going to retrieve your bags. Not there, apparently. Why is that? Do we I'm, know? I'm trying to look. I'm trying to look at your route here. I guess I'd never thought of it. <laughs> I guess I'd never. Because I've gone through that middle one before. Yeah, the middle one is just leaves you out at the level where you check in. Yes, yes. But then you just have to walk right to the to the front of that area by the street and take the escalator down, right? Or well, the the es- the, to be honest, where we went out, there was no convenient escalator. We had to go way to the right. 
I mean, way basically towards long towards the Delta section. Mm-hmm. Then you got to you you go down. Then you got to double back in the other direction. It's like why why do we not have enough people working? Just at eleven o'clock at night, probably not. Okay, on a Sunday night, that would be my guess. It's unfortunate. My guess would be a staffing deal. I've had some doozies in the middle of the night at other. I'm airports. sure you have. Yeah, where you don't know. I you just had really, that in Atlanta, you... going back from the Masters. Oh, good for me. And it was a later flight. It was like 9.30. And the original security wasn't uh, open. I had to go around a corner. I had to go down. TSA Pre wasn't open, which really made me mad. That was a champagne problem because I had built that into my mind. I'm TSA Pre. I'll be flying through this thing, and it didn't work. I don't even think I've ever been on the econ course. Yeah, the, I mean, that's, of course, where I lived because I yes. was a big American guy, yep. and I still, you know, I'm looking at miles, it now. I still am. I'm trying to figure out where you're at here. Yeah, I mean, there is on that side. In other words, it would be to the left of the Toomey store. Yeah. And the uh, the I, the one of the Apple, I don't know if it's an Apple store, but mm-hmm. it's a, sort of one of those kinds of stores. To the left of that, it's just the usual spot. It's, you know, it's traditional. It's no big deal is most of the time of the day, then you just go down the escalator and you're right there. Right. In this case. You just have to go out the exit go, and walk yeah, across the hallway yeah, but, and find the escalator and, there. And again, but there ain't no direct route. Now, the closest, if you want to take elevators, but I, I despise having to mess with elevators, just give me an escalator or stairs to walk down from my flight to get me to the level where the bags are. It shouldn't be too And by the way, generally, when that route is open, there's only one guard. It's not like there's 30. Mm-hmm. There's one guy, I guess, being sure that nobody's coming in up the es- to go up the escalator because of security issues. I, I don't know. Just seems a little odd. I mean, we're at the best airport ever in all the rankings and so forth. Well, I was just going to tell you, I mean, you're you're right now choosing to go up well, against the airport in North America yes. that has been named the best yes, for I'm third challenging straight him year. For, for, for more. Uh, so obviously the airports council international doesn't have a problem with their deplaning. Six one two guy writes the same thing affects concourses C and D, the concourse C and D exits as well. I mean, come on, man, where, are, are we big time or are we not big time? I get it; it's late at night, but we're in, it's supposed to be an international airport. For God's sake, I don't know. I had a, such a meal at I had such a mess at Atlanta. You don't feel that? I I, I feel like well, it that's because you don't know the airport. airport. No, it's where I was directed. Oh. It was what was available, what wasn't, that I <sighs> I think this is happening everywhere. Maybe it is. I'm going to rest on our back-to-back-to-back best airport in North America trophies. I have faith in the Metropolitan Airports Commission, the MAC. Uh, they know it, what they're doing. I, well, they don't, like I said, it's not well thought out given, as Texter Guy writes, the maze of horribly designed ex- escalators as well. Because it's, it's not close to being, okay, it's a straight shot. We go straight ahead. We're on the main concourse, and here's the elevator right here, or the, the escalators right here. It's not even close. You're basically walking another mile either direction. And then you gotta, it, you got to figure out, what's the, is the escalator going in the right direction? Is it going down? Is it going up? Whatever the case may be, it doesn't make any I just expected more. If we ever do a show from the airport, we're, we're gonna we're gonna get to the bottom of it. I'd like to be fun. This is Luis Felipe de Oliveira, Director General of ACI World. Flying through MSP isn't just transit; it's an experience crafted with care. <sighs> Calm down. Success in the airport service quality awards underscores the ability to make every passenger Unless have a memorable get your bags. and enjoyable airport a, journey at eleven o'clock when everybody's tired and we just want to get home. No one made you fly at eleven. Well, we didn't. They're, we weren't supposed to. The, full, the, so the your problems with late. American Airlines? They probably had the escalator open perfectly. Ten thirty. I'm sure the Delta passengers got in perfect. Well, no, they're saying on the other end the same thing. <laughs> you didn't even finish what? your coffee on that one. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, we'll save the fireworks for the five o'clock hour because we're open in the five o'clock hour. We have uh, more serious and tragic stuff to talk about uh, while we were gone as well regarding the uh, Minnesota Vikings. And Kevin Seifert has been all over that particular story. And I think there's even some developments today. So we'll lay all that out, uh, catch up with him on uh, that particular front, and talk other items as well with him. That's Man. news breaking over the weekend that um, a Vikings cornerback to be, the 108th pick, I believe, in this year's NFL draft, uh, Kyrie Jackson, was uh, killed in a horrific car accident. I think the accident took place early morning on a Saturday in the Washington, D.C. suburb of Upper Marlboro, Marlboro. Kevin Seifert has been covering this story, joins us via the Connecticut Water Systems Hotline. Are there any developments? We'll work backwards here, but um, 
Are there some developments today about uh, what prosecutors might do, whether there's what, what kind of potential charges might be coming for the driver who apparently caused the three-car crash? Um, I haven't heard anything on the specific charges that could be coming, but basically since the accident occurred, there's been an investigation between the Maryland State Police and now the Prince George's uh, pros- uh, state attorney's office, the prosecutor, if there is going to be a charge. Uh, and they're investigating the details that you would need to have in order to make charges, whether it's blood alcohol content or what have you. And that is all still being compiled. So as of end of business today, at least, we do not have word on what, if any, charges will be filed as a result of this. But that's where they're at right now. And it could take you know, sure. days to do that. What do we know, again, as, as uh, uh, investigators and policemen trying to sort of recreate precisely what took place on this occasion what do we know about uh, what we think happened here yeah there was a, a pretty detailed narrative in the state police press release that was that came out saturday morning and it was basically that the driver of a silver infinity a woman um was attempting to pass the car that Kyrie jackson was a passenger in in the front uh, passenger seat and was uh, collided with his car and also a third car. Um, all of this at about three fifteen in the morning on Saturday, and uh, Kyrie Jackson, the car Kyrie Jackson was riding in, went off the road and hit uh, a bunch of tree stumps, according to the police report, um, and came to a stop there. Obviously, very suddenly, if you look at the what is really just an unbelievably awful video of the aftermath and what the condition the car was in and how smashed it was. And really, it looked like it was broken in half, essentially. So all three people in the car he was riding in died. Nobody that was in the car, the Silver Infinity, that uh, apparently caused the accident uh, was injured, nor was anyone in the third car that was involved. And so... um, the report said that alcohol may have been a factor. It wasn't specific as to who uh, and what the al- might have consumed the alcohol, but that was going to be part of the investigation. So um, extremely horrific details and visuals out of that uh, later in the morning. And the other, uh, the other individuals in the vehicle in which Jackson was, as you said, a passenger, Front seat. They were teammate, former teammates of his. Is that correct? Football teammates of his. Yeah, high school. They'd all gone to the same high school. Why? I believe it was Wise High School in Prince George County. There, and all three of them had gone on to play college football, um, at multiple stops, and were still friends. And were at this time of year, you know, there's no college football practice going on. There's no NFL practice going on. So they apparently were all back home in that in the town that they uh, were from originally and went to high school in. And so. Um, tragically, yes, all three of them were in the mm. car together um, and, and all died. What, what do we know? And, uh, you know, again, uh, you're, you're around the team, but you don't have time, obviously, to spend extensive amount of time around everybody, especially incoming rookies. Uh, what, did you, what have you come to learn or maybe even knew you know, through this, this offseason about, about Kyrie Jackson? Was that, he's a fourth-round pick, correct? Yeah, he's a fourth-round pick, um, and typically – you know, any like a third day uh, draft pick, uh, especially in the type of draft the Vikings had where they, you know, there was a lot of news and drama around them moving up to get J.J. McCarthy and then later Dallas Turner. So they end up with this really news newsy first round. Um, usually the people picked in the third round are not going to get a whole lot of, of publicity, frankly, um, in the days and weeks and months even after the draft. Um, but Kyrie Jackson, uh, after he was drafted, he was he came on to this. Uh, you know, we do a the, the local media does like a Zoom call with every draft pick, and we just started talking to him, and he just started like telling us the story, his long story, and really like one I had never heard so extensively before of how he managed to get himself in position for the draft. And I think it's probably well known to people now who have been following this, but he had, he was 24 years old. I think he was the oldest player in the draft. And that was because he 
went to, um, uh, he ended up going to junior college out of, out of high school and ended up going to three of them and then taking a couple years off and then eventually making his way to Alabama before finishing his career at Oregon. Um, along the way, he had told us that he had uh, worked in a uh, Harris Teeter, uh, which is a, a grocery store on the East Coast. Um, and maybe elsewhere too, but I know they're all over the East Coast and had worked in the deli shop uh, slicing meat and had become a manager and was won an employee of the month award. And so just a lot of like, really personal details that he gave us and told us how like it made it all the more special that he had eventually gotten himself drafted because there had been a long time uh, where he did not even think he was going to be playing football again um, and simply because of the circumstances. And so, uh, long story short, he had, you know, he, he told a very unique story and I was very much looking forward to getting to know him more, which I expected to happen in training camp. Um, a couple of the reporters on the beat did really nice features on him and sort of fleshed out the story that he had told us, um, the day after the draft. And so I, I can't say that I saw him much on the field during rookie mini camps or OTAs and certainly not during interview sessions, but that's not unusual. Uh, at this time of year. And, um, but he was, uh, he clearly had been around the team and had left a mark. If you watch some of the social media, um, uh, that was put out by various players. And, um, regardless, you know, I think that the, in the bigger context, you know, they're all about the same age that the yep. existing Vikings players and, and Kyrie Jackson. And, and we all have been in a position where somebody our age dies unexpectedly. And it, it very much is a jarring experience. And something that uh, makes you question your own mortality and all of those terrible things. And I, I know for a fact that there's a lot of people in the building and a lot of people on the roster who are having those kind of thoughts, even if they didn't know him that well quite yet. You know, I, I, I think you know this story. Maybe not. It's been a long time ago, and I haven't uh, talked about it on the air in a long time. But you bring, bring up a really important point where, you know, de death is always tragic under these conditions. It doesn't matter the ages of the individuals, obviously. But when it's someone this age, it generally means then, you know, other people that they know and who would be grieving potentially, and at services, for example, funerals, whatever, there'd be a lot of other young people the same age. And it always feels different because you like to think that, that, that individuals that age are too young to have to deal with these, this kind of tragedy. You know, it happened when, you know, my cousin was killed in that value jet plane crash many years ago in Florida, a horrible situation. Mm -hmm. The backstory mm -hmm. there is beyond tragic because all she did was as a favor, she drove down with a uh, Indiana university classmate who didn't want to drive alone. She volunteered to drive down with her. And then the family agreed to then to, to pay her way to fly her back. She was on, that's how she was on that value jet plane. And what I remember mm -hmm. most vividly is that the funeral took place at uh, IU Auditorium, the number of young people, you know, same thing. It's like, you know, you, you, we all have been to funerals, but a lot of times it's older people. You say they've had their moment. It's sad, but it's different. But when you're looking around and everybody's, you know, 20 years old or 19 years old or 23 years old, and in this case, 24 years old, it just, it, it just feels like it takes on a whole new dimension. Yes. And, and I, I can only speak from personal experience. Like I did not think much about death at, at that age. Right. Uh, you think about it a lot more as you get older. Um, and some people, unfortunately, have the, the terrible circumstances of being around it a lot throughout their lives. And um, I can't even uh, identify with that. But I, I would imagine that, um, you know, his funeral will be exactly as you describe, and that there will be a lot of people there who are thinking about things that frankly 20 something year old people shouldn't have to think as much yep. about but it will bring it very much home for them you 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 also like a lot of individuals you posted uh, a link to a photo of 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 Kyrie posing in front of the beach he's got uh, some very exotic you got exotic parrots perched on each yeah. hand big smile on his face the the ocean the water i should say to to, the, to behind him and again you don't have to know him, but that's the sort of thing that does kind of bring. It is that cliched. It sounds trite. That reminder, right? I mean, this was one of the. This was one of the last 
photos he posted. This was just just happening. He's got the big smile, and he's you know he's he's thinking what everybody thinks. It's just another day, but it's just kind of cool today. Yeah. And and now he's gone. It's uh, it's it's, yeah, yeah. it's sad. I to found think about. I found it. I found it incredibly evocative. And also, just thinking about where he was in his life. I mean, I don't think he said it in as many words, but like this was the best moment. These were the best months of his life. You know, after being yeah. drafted, um, he had been building to this for so long, um, and taking a journey that took longer, as long as it's taken any NFL player, that you know, position player in modern history to get to. I mean, he went, I think it was what six or seven years from high school until he, he made it into the draft. And, um, you know, that, that, I mean, it's just that among many, many, many other things just adds to the tragic nature of this is that like you had, he had just gotten there, man. Like it was just starting for him. And, uh, and then this happened. The, and, and as you say, other victims that are the same age. So whether they're yeah. as well known as he, they're going through the, Exact same thing. You've covered, you know, your share of tragedy. Obviously, you had to cover the 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 Corey Stringer story, and among others. And there's always, um, look, I mean, in in this business, the, the teams aren't the only ones who you know suffer through tragedy. People in, in offices, these things happen. So we cover it differently because it's a team. Um, but you can speak to a little bit about the impact it has. He obviously was not as invested. Play, you know, people even on the team didn't know him as well uh, because of the fact that he was just an incoming rookie. But it does tend to take on a different dynamic, does it not? Yeah, and and that's something I was thinking about. You know, what I remember, well, I always remember and think about with Corey Stringer was um, I was in the, you know, I think the day of his not his funeral, but his the local memorial service they had in Edina for him. Uh, there was a bunch of reporters gathered around, and one of them was, you know, was telling them, you know, like one of them, this was had been a really, you know, huge story, obviously, and would be for the rest of the summer. And the reporter corrected me and said, this is a story, you know, this isn't the story for the rest of the summer, for yeah. the rest of this year. You're going to be covering the story for 10 years. And it just, it, there was really this, you know, ripple effect that his death had, you know, on his family, on the team, on the league, on so many different things. And I'm not suggesting it's the same level of, you know, the same type of impact that Kyrie Jackson's death will have. But this is also not simply just a terrible accident that will be a one-off story mm -hmm. that never has any more influence. I mean, it will, in, diff in various ways, carry throughout the, the summer and throughout the season, um, and I don't know when the right time to talk about the on-field impact, but they were hoping and expecting that he would have an on-field impact for them that he will not now have. And there will be that repercussion and just, um, you know, the people that, you know, there's people in the building who spent months and months and probably more than a year scouting him and getting to know him before sort of rising, raising his name up to the level of the decision makers. And, and those people will be very affected and the people who, like Brian Flores and Kevin O'Connell and Quasi Dofomensa, who made the final decision to, to want to draft him, it will it will weigh on them, and it, it doesn't go away, you know. And, and it may fade. And I'm not, you know, saying anything newsy to people who have experienced, you know, unexpected tragic deaths, but around them. But like this is something that'll um, it, that will influence that will have influence on the team and the organization for a long, long time. Yeah, as you say, I mean, the the, the coaches had already, I'm sure, invested in another level than reporters or any, even 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 teammates to a certain extent. And I'm sure they're, you know, it's human nature for them to project. Who, you know, who knows where it would have gone, right? Nobody knows exactly where it would have gone in terms of of the career, but. That's what I'm sure they're, you know, thinking about at a, at a time like this is we'll never know. You know, now we'll never know exactly yeah, there, where this, this might have gone. There's never a more hopeful time for NFL players than this period, you know, where everybody OTAs are usually great for everybody. Many camps are great for everybody. Nobody fails. Nobody sh looks bad in those situations. Everyone is excited for the opportunity yeah. to to see everybody on the field in training camp or to, to participate in training camp and to begin the process of creating the team. And so like this happened right in that window where, where no one 
is ever more highly regarded. Do we have any? I mean, was there any? Was there any? Were there any would-be teammates that got to know him better or a little bit better than than others? Or you mentioned coaches as well that have either yeah, spoken think, or uh, that you've talked to. Well, Dallas Turner, you know, the rookie that they drafted in the first round from Alabama, he was teammates with him with with Kyrie not last season but two seasons ago um, when Kyrie was a backup at Alabama before he transferred to Oregon. So um, I think he's probably, you know, thinking back to has a lot more of a reservoir of experience with him than, than most of the people probably in the organization. Um, and so I think that's one person in particular um, mm. that I think is, 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 it's been hit, has been hit very hard. And we had, I saw there was, I assume, I know that I saw a statement from Quazy and I believe the head coach as well, correct? Um, the, the, yep, and the owners. Yeah, right. Um, this is this is a time of year where, like, there's like the building isn't empty, but it's as empty as you'll ever yeah. see an NFL building. So I think this is the time when those, when even the top people, you know, try to get out of town for a little bit and have their family vacation or go visit places or do whatever they want to do during downtime. And so um, it kind of got people at a in that moment, those few weeks where they try to actually put work aside and, and, and not be thinking about these things. And so I don't know that even, they're even back in the office this week. I think that that picks up next week, but it, uh, it, 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 uh, you know, so there hasn't been like necessarily like a press conference or anything along those lines. And I'm not sure what they would even say mm. at one, if there was one beyond what they put out in the statements, but um, it very much came during that time where everyone's out. And obviously the, coaches and the and the and the personnel step department all hold their breaths that everybody stays safe during this time when they're all separated and um and then this happened i appreciate the time man and we'll uh we'll be we'll be in touch in coming weeks for sure thanks kev yes sir thanks dan kevin seifert can uh, via the connecticut water systems hotline um responding reacting to the and he's written of course a lot over the last several days uh, on the Kyrie Jackson story, one of several individuals um, gone because of a um, what looked like a very reckless act of passing. And, of course, the cliche is always that the individual who apparently is responsible is the one who ends up unscathed. That's not always the case, but it, sometimes it feels that way, and it does feel worse in a circumstance like this. And as we're talking about Garzy with, um, with Seifert, the death is always bad, right? It's always difficult to process. Um, but I think generally, philosophically, there's a feeling of, well, um, I mean, look, we, we grieved the, 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 the horrific Joe Friedberg news, right? Yeah. But there's another side of you that said, well, Joe, hell of a run, memorable run. He didn't get cheated. He did not certainly get cheated. You say, well, that's just the way it happens. It's the way it goes when you reach, especially when you reach those ages, um, it's harder to reconcile when, and it happens every day, um, when it's a kid, right? When we're talking about an individual um, this age. And as I mentioned, I've never, uh, you know, the funeral I talked about for my cousin at IU, in fact, at the, the sorority she's, uh, she was a member of, they're still, they, they, they basically created kind of a commemorative bench for her that has her name on it. You can, it's still there at IU. Um, that's what struck me. Was God, look at look at all these faces, look how young they are, because all of us at some point have to deal with death, and sometimes earlier than we would like. But if you think back to your twenties, right, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one years old in that range, you ain't thinking about it much unless you're unlucky. You're just because you, you're you do feel like you're invincible, and I don't even think that's bad. I think that's. Natural and understandable Part because the other stuff's going to come where it starts kicking in when death starts intruding. So you don't need to be reminded of it. To get reminded of it, a classmate of yours, or in this case, you know, former teammates of his, well, several of them in the vehicle, but other teammates of his and, and, and friends of his that are at the same age, that to me is when it's at its worst. Well, if you've gone through that stage of life and you remember what that stage of life is, and in this case, it's three friends hanging out seemingly in the prime of their lives or about to enter the prime of their lives. We've all been in that part of it where the whole world seems open. The opportunity seems open. Like we talked about with Kevin, like Kevin said, Kyrie probably had the greatest three month run of his yeah. life. You know, come getting drafted from where he came from, from the story that he told 
basically being out of football. And when you're 24 years old, you're you're just thinking about you and your friends and what you're going to do that night. And then when you're going to get to work and all of those things, you're not thinking about any of this for sure. Yeah, he did have, I, I do remember that. He did have, it, it seemed like, a very you know interesting backstory because you get to learn early about some players perhaps more than others, and you never know. You don't know if, uh, how, if he was going to be a factor or, or not. It's irrelevant to the discussion today, but he did have an interesting uh, backstory, and it's those backstories that make all these individuals seem you know, what they are, which is human. And the photo that I'm talking about was, is just a vibrant shot that just is a reminder, as again, tried as it is, one minute you're, you're in the position he is on the beach, and the next minute, it, 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 it could be gone. Unbelievably bad and sad story. Uh, top five at five coming up. What are we looking for? Danny Hurley, Minnesota Twins on the road, and who is the number one option for Team USA basketball?